Good afternoon. As introduced, I am Taegu Kim. Today, among ICH guideline training sessions, this is the first uh, presentation of the final session on the final day, which is about Q Trio, ICH Q89 and 10, and how to approach to those guidelines. I'll do my best to provide detailed explanation for you. This is the table of contents. Pre um, an introduction of ICH 8, 9, and 10, and then I will go um, by each guideline. When all these come together, that becomes related, that becomes that becomes relevant to QBD, the concept of ICH, quality by design, and design space, and DOA, DOE, critical quality attribute, CQA, critical process parameter, CPP, control strategy um, are included. So this is how we connect ICH with QBD. When we say QBD, there are multiple expressions and terms. Risk-based approach is the accurate explanation um, of QBD. ICH guidance Q8 talks about quality targeted product profile. And based on QTTD, CQA knowledge. CQA refers to critical quality attributes. QC test release items in process control and the characteristics analytics. These fall into the category of CQA. Next, CPP, critical process parameters. CPP um, has to do with uh, their impact on critical quality attributes. Through risk assessment, items or components with potential risks will be selected. And if uh, there is a strong impact, it's CPP. If the impact is limited, it's non-CPP. ICH guidance 8, 9, and 10 um, are the basis for QBD. How to apply and where to apply QBD? Process validation guidance of FDA could be the right document to refer to. In 2011, the QBD was introduced. There will be three stages in process validation, and the first stage is process design. Process design contains most of QBD contents. During the design phase, the process validation begins with the development of process. That's the starting point of process validation followed by process validation using PPQ badge, Process Performance Qualification Badge. Following QBD, design specifications are set. It could be lab scale or it could be a pilot scale. 
and to see the representativeness of that small scale in the production scale is process validation. Process performance qualification is the second stage. And the third stage is continuous, continued process verification using monitoring. And this is process validation and guidance. Most of the QBD-related contents in ICH are found in Q8, 9, and 10. Let's take a look at important parts. Q8 talks about pharmaceutical development. Core guideline was selected November 2005, and in two. 2009 and 10, most of member countries introduced this. QBD is the ma major content of Q8. Q9 is for quality risk management, which was introduced for the first, uh, which was introduced in 2005. Most of uh, member countries adopted it already. The major contents are as follows. Quality risk management, including development, manufacturing, distribution of medical product. How to do the risk assessment? What would be the most effective way to minimize potential impact on the product quality? Next, Q10, which is about pharmaceutical quality system, first um, adopted in 2006. Before that, quality system was for GMP facilities regarding operation and management. But after the introduction of Q10, Quality management system concepts for API and final drug products um, has become the scope. Introduction of quality system to cover all of these. In the past, it was only for GMP, but now um, R&D development, process development um, is also under the concept of quality system. In most countries and manufacturing sites, um, they have been introducing QBD. So when was the first time of the adoption of QBD? In 2006, ICHQ9 was introduced, and Q8 was being adopted during the similar period. In 2013, FDA's process validation guidance uh, was reviewed, and most of uh, QBD uh, concept was introduced in stage one process validation. So I believe 2013 is the starting point of the adoption of QBD. This is my personal opinion. ICH guidance Q8, 9, and 10, they're all guidances, not a regulation. Based on this guidance, science, scientific knowledge, and risk-based approach is required. And this encourages more systematic approaches. In the morning, there was a training about product lifecycle management. These guidances are to be applied over entire product lifecycle. Q8, 9, and 10 are often called as Q-trio. 
details will be uh, visited again in the latter part of the presentation. First, in Chapter 1, let's talk about ICHQ-8 pharmaceutical development. There are three sections for pharmaceutical development. First, pharmaceutical development. The components, uh, drug substance, excipients, design, physiochemical um, characteristics, and the background of the process development. And the second um, section talks about the components of the pharmaceutical development, quality objectives, critical quality um, attributes, risk management. To that four talks about design space. To that five talks about control strategy. The objective of ICHQ eight. Among ICH M4 CTD format, 3.2.p.2 talks about pharmaceutical development, and the contents of that section is uh, explained. In product development and manufacturing process for scientific approach and quality risk management, all the available information must be uh, explained. The uh, pharmaceutical Product development during that phase, uh, comprehensive understanding regarding the product and the manufacturing process uh, must be provided to reviewer and inspectors. Both reviewers and inspectors need to have comprehensive understanding of product and process. By providing that understanding based upon scientific approach, the information must be provided. That is the goal and objective of ICHQ-8. Scientific and risk-based approach for pharmaceutical development and process development. I already explained this. Design space and flexible regulatory approach concepts. Flexible regulatory approach is a keyword. In Q12 in the morning, we already discussed this. Flexible regulatory approach, such as QBD, will help you to get an approval for changes or expedite the approval process. As a manufacturer and developer of a pharmaceutical product, by having accurate understanding of the process, the quality of the product gets improved and the risk regarding the product gets reduced. Introduction of QBD and QBD development approach and design space are included in ICHQ-8. The concept of ICHQ-8. Process parameters impact on CQA. Depending on the level of influence and impact. Having an impact means changes in product quality, the degree of change. So those parameters such as temperature, pressure, and material, there could be multiple CQAs, impurities, strength, and so on. So there are multiple CQAs and the parameters. What kind of impact do they have on CQA? That is how we select CPP. 
as a part of control strategy, we have acceptance criteria. The range is called NOR range or PAR range. NOR is for normal operation range. Proven acceptable range is PAR based upon knowledge space and design space. So defining these ranges is uh, included. And once the ranges are set, how to control the work if the temperature and pressures are critical process parameters? How do we calibrate temperature? How do we uh, monitor temperature? These are important tasks. So it's true for pressure. If pressure is one of the critical process parameters, how do we control the pressure? And how do we monitor the pressure level? These must be controlled based on the predefined strategy, and ICHQ8 talks about all these. Pharmaceutical development approach. Uh, let's go over relevant concepts. For pharmaceutical development, quality target product profile, QTPP, needs to be identified. For the safety and efficacy of the pharmaceutical product, to assure um, quality, we need to have a summary of predictive quality attributes. Predictive quality attributes are related to safety and efficacy on safety. Safety and efficacy must be considered to set the objectives, which is the desired quality. This is QTPP. Based on this QTPP, we have to identify critical quality attributes, QC test items and in-process control items, and other analytical um, items could be CQAs. Um, physical, chemical, biological, microbiological characteristics. So when selecting CQAs, as mentioned with QTPP, impact on safety and efficacy and potential risks are considered to establish CQA. Risk assessment approach is applied to select Q CQAs. And then critical process parameters for major processes. For all of the steps, risk assessment must be done to see whether temperature, RPM, pressure, and other parameters will have any impact or potential impact on CQA or not. Utilizing risk assessment methodologies, we determine critical process parameters. Through risk assessment, CPPs are selected, and through analytical methods, such as DOE, design of experiment, or other alternatives. Design space is proposed. By proposing design space, we could have a list of CPP and non-CPP. Next, the final stage is considering CPP and 
CQAs, we come up with control strategy and find a way to apply the control strategy for daily operation. Throughout the life cycle of product, including product improvement activities, there must be a continual improvement. As I explained just now, risk assessment for QTPP and CQA. CQA is about quality. By understanding CQA, we could improve product understanding, including safety and efficacy. Those are process understandings. The quality attributes are influenced by parameters. Those parameters are selected whether those par parameters are critical or not. That is uh, process at, uh, characteristics analysis. That comes also from process understanding. Potential impact on CQA will determine um, CPPs and non-CPPs. Within design space, optimization, set point, NOR, PAR, these ranges will be determined. Example of ICHQ8. Most of risk assessment methodologies will be explained in Q9 part. It starts from process mapping. Each uh, step will be analyzed. This is for biological product manufacturing steps. It starts from working cell banking followed by thawing, seed culture, main culture. So this is the um, scenario, and we do the risk assessment for each step. Cause and effect diagram, aka fishbone, uh, is commonly used. Our CQA here, what would be the parameters having impact on CQAs. Through fishbone approach, we could find that out. These could be potential process parameters. Cause and effect diagram is widely used for that purpose. From cause and effect diagram, potential parameters, temperature, pH, RPM, NDO, what are their impact on CQA? Safety and efficacy related quality attributes are CQA. So what kind of impact would these parameters have? The level of uncertainty, detectability, and so on. So this example uh, is showing FMEA, failure mode and effect analysis. I'll explain what it is in Q9 section. It talks about temperature's impact on CQA, the level of severity and traceability, and then risk priority number, RPN score, is determined, um, and the level of risk is decided, high, medium, and low. After the risk assessment, there could be a single factor, only temperature, for example. But in most cases, uh, there are multiple factors, pH, temperature, and RPM, agitation, 
all together. The optimal way of dealing with these multiple factors would be DOE. The goal of DOE is to have a minimum um, test to get the maximum result. Thanks to these tools and DOE um, methods, we can do that. Full factorial design is uh, popular, but custom design is also used to do DOE. Different parameters such as RPM and temperature, their impact on CQA, multiple CQAs in this case, four parameters and um, four CQAs. We could run the simulation here. And for multiple batches, we could uh, forecast the run. OOS rate can be calculated. PPM failure rate can be estimated. In other words, the success rate could be estimated. With this, we could find the design space. Ultimately, this is where we want to go. Flow rate, pH, and in different areas. Finding out the ideal design space is the goal. And set point and optimization point will be determined. NOR and proven acceptive range uh, can be calculated um, on a representative or reproductive way. Next, Q9. For Q9, it's not just about the QBD, but also the, the selection of the equipment or the reduction of the contamination or prevention of the contamination activities and how to reduce the failure in manufacturing. So those areas are the one where the Q9 can be uh, utilized. So for Q9, this highlights the protection of a patient. That's the most important goal here. And CQA of the product need to be maintained to be identical to the ones in the clinical studies. It means that risk is defined as the probability and severity of harm. So the goal of Q9 is to provide the systematic management and control of the quality. And this provides a foundation or the resource document that is independent of, yes, supports other ICH quality document and complements existing practices and requirement and standards and others. Then what about the scope? It provides principles and examples of tools for quality risk management that can be applied to different aspects of pharmaceutical quality. And these aspects include development, manufacturing, distribution, and inspection and submission review process throughout the life cycle of drug substance, drug product, biological, and biotechnological biotechn products. And there are two principles of uh, quality risk management. The evaluation of the risk to quality should be based on scientific knowledge and ultimately linked to the protection of the patient. And the level of efforts, formality, and documentation of quality risk management process should be commensurate with the level of risk. It means if the risk level is high in the risk analysis, then that risk need to be reduced that is called as the risk reduction. And the activities to reduce the risk or the document on those activities should be commensurating with the level of risk itself. This slide explains very well the Q9 structure. 
So with that slide, I will explain what Q9 is intended to achieve. This is very a uh, snapshot of Q9. I think you have seen this uh, slide before. Quality risk management process is the name of this uh, pictorial diagram. There are three parts. One is risk assessment and risk control part and risk review part. For risk assessment, uh, it is to identify uh, where and what risk is there and what kind of parameters or equipment are at risk. So here we try to find out and identify risk. So the risk ident identification is the very first step of the risk assessment. And once risk is identified, then uh, we have to do some analysis. And third step of the risk assessment is risk evaluation. We have to think about whether this risk is quite feasible and appropriately analyzed. Then once the risk is known, then the risk need to be controlled, which means that it should be reduced. We can do repeated studies sometimes, or for process or equipment, we can do uh, qualification and validation. So these are the risk reduction activities that we can think of. And then we have to reduce the risk at the level of the risk of acceptance. And that should be regularly monitored. The regular monitoring means that we can reduce risk. But as time goes on, there can be another risk. So when it comes to risk review, it should be done periodically. The risk assessment and risk management cannot be done by one person. It should involve the leadership and also it should be communicated well. Risk management, risk control cannot be done by one person. It should include all different functions like QA, QC, and others. So all the functions have to communicate on risk. And there should be some tools for that. As I shared, like Fishbone, Process Mapping, FMEA, FMEC, HACCP, there are many different tools that we can use for risk management. Uh, here comes the risk assessment. In Q9, we have to identify first if there is any impact on the quality. This it's really important to understand the probability of risk occurring, whether such risk of, uh, occur quite often or we do not even know uh, whether such risk occur or not. And we also have to think about the impact of the risk. When the quality goes wrong, it can impact on the life of the patient, and it can create more AEs. So it will impact on the patient outcome. So these kind of the questions need to be uh, thought about and also uh, answered in the risk evaluation. So risk identification, as I explained, the very first step. Here, we have to pay attention to historical data and theoretical analysis and informed opinions. So these should be the background or the backbone of the risk identification, experience and literature and reasonable and logical opinion. These should be the basis for the risk identification. The next step is risk analysis. 
once we identify the risk, then we have to do the estimation of the risk associated with the identified hazard. The detectability is also important. Then comes the risk evaluation. When we evaluate risk, we can say the risk is high, moderate, and low. We can go for such qualitative measures, or we can provide some quantitative measures like more than 40% or 50 scores like that. Scoring can be done. So we have to be very clear about the risk and evaluate them. The next step is the risk control. It is important to see whether the risk can be reduced to an acceptable level and the decision makers may uh, use different processes, including benefit cost analysis, to understand the optimal level of risk control. There are important questions to be asked here. Is the risk above an acceptable level? Can, what can be done to reduce or eliminate risk, like repeated testing, verification, and others? What is the appropriate balance among benefit, risk, and resources? For example, during the process development, the risk is high, so we try to reduce the risk so that we allocate budget for that activity. Then we realize that we expect to have about 3 billion green one of uh, sales after the commercialization, but reduction of risk caused more than 3 billion grand one. If that is the case, this is too high investment in reducing the risk. If that is the case, we may drop the project or we have to think about other directions for development. So even the ICH guideline talks about finding the uh, right balance uh, among the resources, risk, and the uh, expected outcomes. And we also think about what our new, our new risk introduced as a result of identified risk being controlled. We have to review it and have to understand it. The risk reduction. We have to reduce the risk probability or reduce the uh, risk level so that uh, it doesn't exceed a, a sec of acceptable level. And the implementation of risk reduction measures can, may introduce new risk into the system or increase the significance of other existing risk. And therefore, we have to review the changes to the uh, risk level if a certain action is taken. Risk of communication is important, well-trained and experts and decision makers need to be involved in communicating risk. And those communication need to be well documented. So the, and that kind of uh, documents should include information uh, about like the existence, nature, form, probability, severity, acceptability, and other aspects of risk. So risk management should be an ongoing part of the quality management process. There should be a mechanism to review or monitor events. Because even if we do the risk review, that's not the end of the story. We have to always monitor the status in order to look at and understand if there is any new risk introduced or uh, any changes to the risk situation. And we also have to um, monitor and control whether these events are planned or not. And the frequency of any review should be based upon the level of risk. These are the risk management tools in ICHQ9. 
flow chart, process mapping, uh, causal effect diagram, FMEA, FMECA, FTA, HACCP, and others. The manufacturers and the fast sponsors need to uh, assess those tools and then select for their use. Usually, FMEA is used widely. Then how the risk is scored is also managed and decided by the manufacturer to their situation. Influence, uncertainty, and detectability, these are the basis to score the risk. It can be like 10 point score or high, very high, moderate, low, very low, or just a high, moderate, and low. These can be decided by the manufacturer. These severity, impact, and probability detectability should be well defined. And there should be also traceability for these risk. The same slide that I shared already, uncertainty, severity, or detectability, these are calculated to produce RP and risk priority number. The items with high risk should be given priority in risk reduction. The next one is Q10. PQS or pharmaceutical quality system. When it comes to the quality culture, there are three pillars, Q8, Q9, and Q10. When they are well implemented, then the quality of the pharmaceuticals can be well sophisticated when well improved. And the culture to uh, do it is the quality culture. So when it comes to the goals in quality, it is, of course, the regulatory approval is important, but at the same time, throughout the drug product life cycle, the quality need to be well controlled and maintained. And GMP regulation is important in that sense. And also, we have to refer to ICH guideline in order to do so. And quality risk management and quality system need to be well established and well utilized. And that is important in terms of establishing quality culture. So for PQS, knowledge management, process performance, and quality of the product, uh, they need to be well controlled, and that is done on the uh, PQS. So innovation and continuous improvement are strived after. So during the life cycle of the product, whether it is the finished product or the DS, uh, it should be applied, and the control strategy is important. So Q8 and Q10, pharmaceutical quality system and pharmaceutical development, when they are used together, that will provide a very flexible approach in terms of regulation. So if you look at the diagram, the first step is the pharmaceutical development. The good manufacturing practice may not be uh, the mandatory requirement here. However, good documentation uh, practice, the GDP, need to be complied with. Starting from here, actually, we have to apply PQS, process performance, process quality monitoring system, and CAPA system, change management system, an overall quality review and quality management system need to be uh, prepared gradually from the very early stage of the development. And quality risk management 
need to be started from the development phase. Once the development is over, then we transfer technology within the same company from R&D function to G uh, manufacturing or from one site to another or between different companies, the technology is transferred. At this stage, all these elements need to be applied. In Q12, during the uh, morning session, experts also share the same idea. The next step is the commercial manufacturing. Of course, here the GMP need to be abide by PQS as we do. PQS here need to be applied. In Q10, the ISO strategy is also uh, reflected. The management responsibility is also well defined here. FDA guidance too talks about the responsibility of the leadership. These are all integral part of the PQS. There are four major elements of the PQS, and one of them is the management responsibility, and it also includes resources, manufacturing operations, and evaluation activities. When we are good on this element, then we can have the consistent manufacturing of the safe and effective product. For management, they have to uh, focus on the leadership and the structure of the organization and establishing the quality system. For resources, it means well-trained operators and validated facilities and equipment, and the management of the outsourcing, including technology transfer. For manufacturing operations, it, of course, involves the manufacturing and process design and development and documentation and the monitoring of the operation and the uh, management of the reject QBD plus GMP areas are all covered by here. For evaluation activities, trending and internal audit and quality risk management and CAPA activities are major activities under evaluation activities. So including the consistent improvement, continuous improvement of the quality at the end, till the end of the uh, process. We have to utilize PQS, for example, for the pharmaceutical development. Uh, we design a product and its manufacturing process to consistently deliver the intended performance. For technology transfer, the transfer product and process knowledge between development and manufacturing and within or between manufacturing sites to achieve a product realization. For commercial uh, manufacturing, the goal is to achieve a product realization The scale-down model or the lab-scale model at the pharmaceutical development or technology transfer need to be realized as a scale-up model in the manufacturing of commercial products. And then uh, there should be state of control to facilitate continual improvement. The PQS need to be well applied here. And once again, I repeat myself, at the development phase, the, uh, the management responsibility is important. The development, technology transfer, commercial uh, manufacturing, and product discontinuation through the process. Uh, there are important elements like, as you can see, in the PQS, we have to have the monitoring system for process performance and product quality, CAPA system, change management system, and the management or leadership review. So over the life cycle, the quality management activities 
should cover the development, technology transfer, and commercial manufacturing and product discontinuation. Uh, these activities is called as the PQS because the PQS is the system to manage the quality related activities over the life cycle. And all these activities need to be well planned, well monitored, and well documented. QBD and product development and risk uh, assessment. And Q8 and Q9 and Kappa and Q10. These are well explained in ICH guidelines. In Q10, this is my final slide. The quality management process need to be well established for Q10. The document, design, development, and product and process, and inspection of receiving materials, and reject handling, trendings, internal audit, self-inspection, kappa. All these require appropriate procedures. If we have that, then we can well implement Q10. That's my uh, presentation. That was my presentation. So if you have any questions, I will answer your questions.